start recording. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to have Professor Alexander Grisby here to give us a talk on her recent work on the geometry and the complexity of the uh, deep ReLU networks. And Professor Alexander Grisby is now a professor in the mathematics uh, department at Boston College. And her earlier training was in low dimensional topology and geometry. And her uh, recent research interests have shifted from uh, the low dimensional geometry to the mathematical foundations of deep learning algorithms. And she received the AWM Berman Re uh, Research Prize in topology and geometry in 2015, and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineer. Uh, in 2016, and also served as a deputy director of the Institute of uh, Computational and Experimental Research Mathematics uh, from 2018 to 19. And without further ado, let's enjoy Alice's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you all for your um, for your presence and your attention. Um, <clears throat> so, what I want to tell you about today is. Um, based on joint work with Catherine Lindsay and Rob Meyerhoff, who are also in the BC math department, and Chun Chi Wu, who is also who is in the math department at um, Wisconsin Madison. Um, and some of the work is joint with Catherine Lindsay and David Rolnick, um, who has probably spoken in this seminar before as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so let me just start very basic. Um, so what we're interested in here is, of course, supervised learning problems and the um, and always what we're doing is we're given some finite data set, some labeled data set, and it's sampled from some un unknown probability distribution. And our task is to, first of all, choose a parameterized hypothesis class of functions that, predict, that we're hoping will predict the labels from the inputs, and then use some optimization algorithm to find um, an optimal predictor of the labels, but on unseen data drawn from this uh, distribution. And always what I what I think here is that the most important um, choice is this parameterized hypothesis class. Um, if you make the wrong choice, then um, um, that's that's going to skew things um, much more than making the wrong um, parameterization choice once you've chosen the class. But um, but I think what I want to kind of try to motivate here is that actually um, very often our intuition about the parameterized hypothesis class is quite different from what, um, from what, um, well, the, the actual truth of what the, the way that the hypothesis class behaves is um, sometimes quite different from our intuition. So that's what I want to sort of motivate to begin with. Hmm. So the motivating question for pretty much the bulk of this talk is, well, given a parameterized function class for learning, um, does the parameter um, how, how well does the parameter space model the function class? Um, sorry, for some reason my um, the uh, the something on on Zoom is covering up my slide, so I'm going to try to move it over um, so it doesn't cover up my slide anymore. Um, okay, how well does the parameter space model the function class? And of course, why we should care about this is that whenever we're doing these um, supervised learning problems, our optimization algorithms are always proceeding in parameter space. Um, but really, um, the, the loss, whatever loss function we choose, um, really depends only on the function and not on the particular parameter that we use to define the function. So what this is telling us that if, is that if there is any kind of function redundancy, or inhomogeneity in parameter space, this is definitely going to bias our optimization algorithms in some way. <clears throat> okay, so the, the particular function class that I'm gonna be interested in for this talk is ReLU neural networks. So um, here's a picture that I've stolen from um, Michael Nielsen's online textbook, Neural Networks and Deep Learning. Um, and so this picture represents a class of functions from um, Rn0 to Rnd, where N0 is the number of neurons in the input layer, and Nd is the number of neurons in the output layer. And we have all these hidden layers, and this function is defined as a composition of functions um, in this way. 
And um, when I when I write the architecture for a uh, feed, for, so all of my um, neural networks will be fully connected um, and feed forward. And um, when I write architecture N0 through ND, um, what I mean is the dimensions of all of the layers that you're passing through as you're defining your function from the input layer to the output layer. And the so always these functions are defined by um, giving um, specifying some affine linear function between the layers, between adjacent layers, and then composing with a uh, component-wise activation function. And the modern activation function of choice um, is ReLU, this piecewise linear function um, whose graph is given here on the right. Um, so by the way, please please stop me at any time by unmuting and um, uh, and just uh, saying something if you have a question, because um, I can't really see the chat. Okay, so um, so one thing that is well known about this class, this entire class of functions, and um, I attribute this to Aurora Bazumianji Mukherjee from 2018, is that the class of ReLU neural network functions, if you allow yourself to have any number of hidden layers of any dimension at all, is exactly the class of piecewise linear functions from RN0 to RND with finitely many pieces. So you partition your domain into these convex polyhedra and the function is linear on each piece and continuous, affine linear on each piece and continuous. But what is quite unknown is if you fix the architecture, um, what part of this entire space of finite piecewise linear functions do you map into? So that's a, that's a I think, a quite hard question that um, is not really the focus of my talk today, but I think it's a quite interesting question. Um, and it's the kind of thing Wu Yang um, knows quite a, quite a lot about. Okay. Um, so um, just because it will be necessary to understand some of the things I'll say later, let me just tell you, say a little bit more about the geometry of the situation right now, when we're talking about ReLU neural networks, some of the geometric objects that I'll be interested in. So again, as I mentioned, um, a map between layers of the neural network um, is given by a composition of an affine linear function with this component-wise ReLU. Um, and <clears throat> really you can you can encode the the um, at least sort of um, first picture of this map by looking at the zero sets of each of the components of this function of the affine linear function first. Um, and these define, affine hyperplanes in the domain of each layer. So I've denoted these H1, H2, H3. Um, so a function from R2 to R3 would give rise to um, a hyperplane arrangement. And in fact, it also, um, some nice information, some nice additional information that you can extract from the parameters for this layer map is a coding of the regions of the hyperplane arrangement according to whether a neuron is on or off in that region. So remember that this ReLU function is very um, violent in that if the input to the ReLU is negative, it just sets it to zero. So knowing that a neuron is off in a region um, is really telling you quite a lot about what the image of that region will be in the next layer. Okay. And the other thing that I, that I want to point out is that it's actually quite useful to think about pulling back these hyperplane arrangements from later layers to the domain. And um, generically, so for most parameters, when you do this, you get something that is kind of like a hyperplane arrangement, but where the, the piecewise, the, the, the embeddings, these zero sets that you're pulling back um, can bend at hyperplanes from previous layers. So this is what um, 
Um, so I first read this terminology in a paper of Hannon and Rolnick, and they called this a bent hyperplane arrangement, but I'm not sure if this terminology predates that paper. Okay, so the idea here in this picture on the lower right um, is, that, um, is that if we take zero sets of neurons from later layers, they pull back to things that kind of look like hyperplanes, but they can bend. Okay, um, so this is this is sort of just a little bit about the geometry underlying ReLU neural networks. And um, by the way, the, the regions of this bent hyperplane arrangement um, are exactly the regions on which, well, not exactly, but um, on each of these regions, the ReLU neural network function will be linear, affine linear. Okay, so um, so the main points that I that I want you to take away from this talk, um, if you remember nothing else that I say about ReLU neural networks, um, is that for any fixed architecture of depth at least two, what I what I'd like to convince you of is that parameter space is highly redundant, and not only is it redundant, but it's inhomogeneous. So in fact, it's really kind of a lousy proxy for the true hypothesis class. And I also wanna convince you that I think this is a feature, not a bug of ReLU neural networks as a hypothesis class. Okay. Um, so here's an outline of the talk. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why parameter space is not um, equal to the function space for ReLU neural networks. Um, then I'm going to define um, this um, um, sort of a better um, measure of complexity for ReLU neural networks than parametric parametric dimension, which is um, what we call the functional dimension. And then I'll talk a little bit about this inhomogeneity and some of the mechanisms that give rise to it. Okay. So let's start here. So what I'd like to convince you of in the next few slides is that the parameter space for ReLU neural networks is really not the same thing as the function space for ReLU neural networks. And I'd like to start actually with, um, not with ReLU networks, but with a class of functions that I think we draw most of our intuition about parameter space um, for parameterized function classes from. So, uh, class of functions that we're very familiar with are polynomial functions. And I think that we really do draw most of our intuition about parameterized function classes from the class of polynomial functions. So let me just tell you what I believe our kind of standard intuition about um, parameterized function classes is. So if you consider, for example, polynomials in a single variable of degree n, so they look like this. Well, the parameter space is really the space of coefficients for the for the polynomial. And the reason why this is a great proxy for the space of polynomials is that if you have two polynomials and their coefficients are different, then the functions are different. So you have an, um, a one-to-one -one or injective map from parameter space to function space in this case. And not only that, but if you think about, so, you know, we usually think of degree of a polynomial as being a really good proxy for the complexity of the function in this class. Um, and indeed, what's nice about the, the class of polynomial functions is that also lower class, lower complexity subclasses of functions will be measure zero in this parameter space. Meaning, you know, if you just generically draw a parameter, you'll get a degree n polynomial. It's very unlikely to get a polynomial of degree less than n um, or polynomials of, you know, that are lower complexity for other reasons. Okay, so th this is an example of a parameter space that is really, really nice and homogeneous. Um, and the complexity measured by the parametric dimension is a really good um, measure of complexity for the for the class. 
So in contrast, if we look at um, ReLU networks, it turns out that um, parameter space actually has a lot of so-called symmetries. And what I mean by that, so so let me let, before I say that, let me um, uh, let me remind you. So the parameter space for a ReLU network architecture with layers of dimension n zero through n d, d being the depth, is <clears throat> um, is R to the capital D, where d capital D is just the number of weights and biases for all these affine linear functions. So it's this nice quadratic function in the um, in the dimensions of the layers in the width. And what I'm claiming is that this is not the same, this, this parameter space is not the function space for the architecture in the way that the parameter space for polynomial functions is really equal to the function space for the architecture. <clears throat> so the function space for the architecture, as I said, it's, it's contained in finite piecewise linear functions from Rn0 to Rnd in, in some way that we don't really understand. But what I'd like to say is that this, this parameter space is not the same thing as the function space, first of all. Um, so we have this realization map. If, if, if we're given a collection of parameters, we can um, construct a piecewise linear function. But what I'm claiming is that this, fun this realization map is very, very much not injective. It's many to one. So many, many different parameters define the same function. And moreover, it's not just not injective, there are positive dimensional spaces of symmetries. So, um, so in fact, the parametric dimension is in general higher than the what I'm going to define later as the functional dimension of a particular parameter. Okay, this is actually probably a good place for me to just pause and make sure that, um, no questions have come up. Okay. Um, so if there are no questions, I'll charge forward. <clears throat> so um, let me just say a few things about um, history, the, the, the history of this kind of problem. Um, so the, the question of sort of redundancy or symmetry and parameter space for neural networks um, goes back at least as far as the 1990s, where Pfefferman and Markle and independently Albertini and Sontag investigated um, uh, symmetries of this kind for um, neural networks with sigmoidal activation. And in that in that setting, they actually um, prove that that um, there are just some discrete symmetries. Um, which are related to what I'm going to talk about in a moment. And, um, and up, up to those known symmetries, actually, um, the parameters can always be recovered from the function. So there's a little bit of redundancy, but it's not a lot. Um, and um, I'll also mention that, um, that Amari Watanabe and, and others um, talked about this sort of quotienting of parameter space to the actual space of functions. And they called um, for, for various activation functions and they called this, um, this object, the neuro manifold. And the, the main thing that they were studying um, is the, so the main point that they were making is that standard statistical learning theory doesn't behave well around singularities of this quotient space from parameter space to the actual function space. So remember you have this realization map, it's many to one, so it's squashing a bunch of parameters. So you get singularities um, in your space. And so what, what this, this, co this collection of people was doing was looking at um, how the sort of standard ideas and statistical learning theory break down in, in the setting, in that setting. Um, I also want to mention this recent work um, from 2018 of Armenta, Jodoin, and a bunch of others. Um, so what they do is they actually look at the computational graph for um, 
neural networks with various activation functions. And they really very carefully from this computational graph, they, um, they specify exactly what the global symmetries on parameter space should be depending on this data. So not just for ReLU, but for, um, but for general um, different kinds of activation functions. Um, and the work that is sort of closest to what I'm gonna be talking about is work of Cording and Rolnick and independently Fuang Lampert from around 2020. Um, and um, all, all of this work is about understanding when um, a parameter for a ReLU network can be extracted from the function up to some known global symmetries. So the kinds of global symmetries that you see from this quiver representation theory framework. Okay. So, um, so, the, so the main takeaway from all of this is that um, people have been thinking about um, the, the realization map from parameter space to function space in various contexts. Um, but I think that the case of ReLU is most interesting because ReLU is most used in modern um, regression tasks. And in fact, it turns out to be quite interesting, um, the, the, this question of the realization map and how redundant it is. Okay, so let me now tell you a little bit about the well-known globally defined symmetries for um, parameter space for ReLU network functions of a fixed architecture. So the well-known symmetries of ReLU networks are, so um, permutation of neurons in hidden layers. So if you, um, if you look at a particular hidden layer, you can permute the neurons in that layer um, and the corresponding weights and biases going in and going out um, will be permuted in the same way. And that's not going to affect the, the eventual function. You're just re renumbering all the neurons in the layer. So this is exactly the, the, um, the symmetry that, for example, was present in the Pfefferman Markle um, Albertini Sontag work from the 90s. And the point here is that this is um, discrete. This, these symmetries are discrete. They're zero dimensional. So they take parameters to like parameters that are far away. Um, and there are finitely many of them because there are, um, so for each parameter, there are finitely many other parameters that are connected to this one by this symmetry uh, because it's a finite group of symmetries. Um, but the more interesting one, the, the more interesting global symmetry um, is this positive scaling symmetry. So in this picture, um, this brown circle represents a hidden neuron. And then the purple arrows are all of the um, weights coming into this hidden neuron and the orange are the weights coming out. And the point is that you can actually, you can positively scale all the weights coming in by a, um, a positive real number and then um, scale the weights going out by the inverse of that positive real number, and it doesn't affect the overall function. And you can do this for each hidden neuron separately. And what's interesting about this symmetry is that it's positive dimensional. So in fact, right off the bat, what we see is that the function space of a ReLU network of architecture N0 through ND, so these are the dimensions of the layers, has dimension at most. So here, um, what this lemma is saying in a nutshell is that the parametric dimension isn't really the true dimension of the space of functions because you have this redundancy coming from each from the positive scaling for each hidden neuron. So in fact, whatever the um, whatever we're gonna talk about the functional dimension of a parameter to be, the true dimension of a parameter to be, um, it's not the parametric dimension that we know for sure because of these well-known globally defined symmetries. 
on parameter space. It's in fact less than that, less by the number of hidden neurons. Okay. Um, so this D prime is what I'm gonna refer to later in the talk as the theoretical upper bound on the functional dimension. So the theoretical upper bound on the functional dimension, um, so sort of the true dimension of a parameter in parameter space is not the parametric dimension, but a little bit lower than that. Okay, so now, now I'm ready to tell you um, to carefully tell you what I mean by the functional dimension of a parameter and parameter space. And, and it's this um, dimension that I think is a good proxy for the complexity of the function defined by that parameter. So we've been thinking of the complexity of a parameter as being you know, uh, the parametric dimension, um, but, it, but in fact, actually this complexity varies as you move through parameter space. Okay, so to, to, to get us started so that we actually kind of understand what we mean really by, by the functional dimension before I define it carefully um, and mathematically, let me just give a couple of examples. And this will also get us into thinking a little bit about the geometry of ReLU networks and how they, that plays into understanding this functional dimension. So, Okay, so let's take this very simple architecture, one, two, one. And um, contrary to convention, I'm going to put the, the activation function on both of these layers, just so I can um, have something to talk about right now, um, but, but keep the example small. So this, so typically we don't put the activation function on the final output layer, but in this example, we will. Okay, so um, as we can count, the parameter space is seven dimensional. And here is um, a picture of the hyperplane arrangement with the regions um, labeled by whether neurons are on or off um, in the um, input layer. So here, hyperplanes, of course, are just points because you're, you're in R1. Um, and so you have these two points and they separate the domain into these three regions. And we've labeled the regions according to whether the first and the second neurons are on or off on that region. And what's nice about doing that from the point of view of geometry and understanding what the function does is that we see that the binary tuples that we assign to these regions are telling us, so we know that the image of this layer in the next layer must land in the non-negative orthant of R2 um, because ReLU sends everything that's negative to zero. So it lands in the non-negative orthant. Um, and in fact, I've drawn here where that real line, the image of that real line in R2. So this is the second, this is the hidden layer. And we see that the blue, this blue arc lands in the sort of open part of, of this non-negative orthant. And the green, the, the two green parts land on the, the boundary according to the binary tuple. That tells us what, what face it lands in. Okay, and then this pink line that I've drawn is the hyperplane, the oriented hyperplane associated to the to the next layer map. And what this, what the combinatorics and the geometry of this picture allow us to do is tell us what the shape of the graph of such a function will be as a map from R to R, a piecewise linear map from R to R. So the value for a point in the domain is essentially given by the height above that pink hyperplane. Where if something is below that oriented hyperplane, it will get smushed up to zero. So that's, that, that's um, how I've drawn the shape of the graph of this function. And we quickly see that, you know, so it's very easy to parameterize piecewise linear maps from R to R. 
by their breaks and their slopes. Um, so for example, you can label the three break points of this piecewise linear function. And one thing we do know is that the slope of the, of the interval between P2 and P3 is zero. So we don't have any, um, any choice there, but we have these three other slopes that we could possibly choose. So from the shape of this graph, we know, for example, that the function space corresponding to this, um, uh, this architecture has at most six degrees of freedom. It, it has less actually, but, but just from the shape of the graph, we can see that it has six degree, at most six degrees of freedom. Whereas um, if we had a different situation, a different binary coding for the regions, um, we get something that looks different and the graph of the function looks quite different as well. Um, so again, because the entire light green region is being mapped to zero um, in the hidden layer, um, the its image is always constant height above this pink hyperplane. So now we get two of the regions having zero slope and we have at most five degrees of freedom. So we can see even in this very simple example how this inhomogeneity is going to arise in terms of the number of degrees of freedom we have for specifying the function. Okay, so that, so now now I get to actually tell you what the functional dimension is, the, give you the definition, and this is um, local functional dimension near a parameter. And in fact, I can't really define it for all parameters, but I'll I'll try to tell you um, sort of I'll go through some of the technical points, but very quickly later. But I just want to give you the idea. Um, so of course. If you have a parameter in parameter space for a ReLU network, this gives rise to a function from the input layer to the output layer. And how are we going to define the functional dimension? Well, we'll define it in a few steps. So um, if, if you now fix a point in the domain, you can actually think about the following question. You can think about, well, if you look near the parameter, um, what's the what are the directions in parameter space that you can move that change the value of your function just at that point? Okay, so this is a question about um, uh, some subspace of the tangent space at your parameter in parameter space. And now if you have some batch of points in your domain, and you fix this parameter theta zero, you can ask the same question for that batch. Namely, what's the span of the directions in parameter space that you can move, that you can perturb your function, your parameter theta naught, in order to change the value of this function that you get um, for at least one point in your batch? Okay, so that's the, that's the picture. You're, you're looking in parameter space. What are the directions that you can move to change the value of your function on this set of points? Okay, so formally speaking, let me, let me write this down formally. So if you fix a batch of points in your domain, you have the evaluation map from parameter space to um, K by, Oh, that, that should be capital N. Oh, that's bad. Um, this K should be the number of points. I changed my notation at some point. Um, but the point is, yeah, if you have K points now, um, then each row is, is giving you sort of the output of your function on that, um, that point. And just vectorize this, unroll it. <clears throat> Um, and then the functional dimension at a parameter relative to this batch will just be the rank of the Jacobian matrix for this evaluation map. So 
um, you're just you're just taking each of these unrolled vectors and you're taking the the partial derivative with respect to each of the parameters. Um, and now you're taking the rank of this matrix. And um, the point is that the rank of this matrix is precisely the dimension of the subspace of tangent space uh, of the tangent space at the parameter theta naught that you can move in order to change the value of the function at the batch. So that's really how you should think about this. So this is the dimension of the space of tangent vectors at theta naught impacting the value of f theta on this batch Z. But the other point is that you can just, you can compute this. You can just actually just compute it. Um, and this is what we call the batch functional dimension for a batch C. And now if we want to actually compute the functional dimension, not relative to a particular batch, what we really wanna do is imagine that we're um, trying to understand this rank, um, how, how this rank stabilizes as we, as we choose any batch in our domain. So if we don't want it to depend on the particular points we choose, um, we just allow the number of points um, to go to infinity, say, um, and we take the soup of this rank. And this is, this is what we call the functional dimension at a parameter. Um, and this, you should really think of this as the dimension of the space of tangent vectors at your parameter theta naught that impact the value of your function anywhere. And of course, this sounds really bad. Um, it sounds like the kind of thing you can't really compute. Um, but in fact, actually, we don't need to take infinitely many points. Um, uh, and you can actually approximate this. So this is what we call the local functional dimension at theta naught. OK, so um, I'm just going to go through these technical points really quickly. Um, yeah, the main point is that um, these functions are piecewise linear. Um, uh, so we need to worry about smoothness. And in fact, if we kind of um, look at the function from um, parameter space, cross input space to, um, uh, to the output layer, um, that's a piecewise polynomial function. And so we have to restrict um, in order to be able to talk about this Jacobian at all. Um, okay, so probably I don't need to say all these all these technical points, but I but I do want to say there are some technical things we need to we need to think about. But the main point that I wanted to make here is that that soup that we're um, that we're taking that the supremum over all these ranks, we don't need to to um, we don't need to just kind of we 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 know we've achieved um, uh, the computation of the functional dimension as long as we as long as we take um, n0 plus 1 points in each linear region. Okay, so it's not an infinite set that we need to um, uh, take this rank from for. Okay, so let me let, let me now show you some experiments. Um, because I think this is, this is where it becomes clear that this functional dimension is not just computable, but um, at, well, at least approxim approximately computable. Um, again, what's really hard is actually determining the linear regions of your, of your function. Um, that's really computationally expensive, but you can sample a lot of points and you'll get something that, um, is at least an approximation of your functional dimension. So as your batch size gets quite large, um, you're gonna, um, in many cases, hit your functional dimension. Um, so here, so these are some experiments that, um, that were run by David Rolnick um, in joint work with Catherine Lindsay and myself. Um, and here, what's, what's happening is that um, he's, measuring the functional dimension, well, the approximate functional dimension for various widths and depths. So here, blue represents width five, orange width 10, green width 15, and we're allowing the depths to, 
vary from three to six. And what we're plotting, so again, the number of points in each batch for the computation of this approximate functional dimension is the number of, um, it's twice this theoretical upper bound on the, on the functional dimension. And so I want to point out that the batch doesn't is, is not guaranteed to achieve this supremum of the ranks. So we have to call it the approximate functional dimension. This is not actually necessarily the functional dimension. Um, but what David did is for 20,000 different parameters in each run, he plotted the, um, the functional dimension, that rank that you get. And um, the black dots here represent the percentage of the sample networks that achieve the theoretical upper bound. So for, for example, for width 15 and depth three, most of the parameters achieve this um, up, theoretical upper bound. Um, but as, but um, as the width increases and the depth decreases, um, so this expected functional dimension is closer to that theoretical upper bound. But as the width, um, uh, sorry, I think I might have written the, no, no, this is this is correct. Um, as the depth increases, you notice that this expected functional dimension actually shifts away from this functional from from the from the uh, theoretical upper bound. So you get these really nice um, distributions for higher depth, where this approximate functional dimension is actually not in general achieving this theoretical upper bound. It's much lower, and it's it's kind of um, uh, the it, it's it's shifting. And the other thing that you can observe from looking at this is that the variance is increasing with width and with depth. So for, for example, for width 15 and depth six, so the lower right picture, you have this really nice variance, um, large variance as compared to the other widths for that depth. Um, and and the other kind of interesting feature here is that there are there are multimodal, um, especially at high width and low depth. So you're seeing these alternative peaks happening, which is really suggesting that there are certain um, dominant mechanisms for the dimension not achieving that theoretical upper bound, um, especially for lower depth. Okay, <clears throat> so let me pause again. Yeah, Adi, um, may I just quickly chime in for a question? Yeah. Um, so uh, I can see that um, uh, from the depth three to depth, depth six, the uh, for each certain width, the complexity seems still uh, increase a little bit. For example, the uh, with the uh, the green bars. Mm -hmm. uh, the complex shifted from like uh, 400 ish to eventually over 1000. So that doesn't mean that uh, the uh, expected functional dimension uh, dimension will also increase along the depths. Yeah, I mean, so so this is sort of as compared to the theoretical upper bound. And of course, as you increase the depth, the number of parameters will also grow. So that theoretical upper bound will also grow. But this is sort of as compared to that theoretical upper bound. Um, but yes, you're right. You know, absolutely. As you as you um, increase the number of neurons, you're necessarily going to get um, higher complexity. But but what's cool is that the variance um, um, increases as well. Yep, so you yep. get kind of more uh, you know more inhomogeneity in terms of this functional dimension. But yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. The reason why the yeah. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. May I ask two questions? Uh -huh. Yes, of course. Hi. So one is about the notion of batch 
are you talking about uh, the batch, like mini batch in people usually talk in neural networks and because this can change, right? And, uh, and yeah, we can, right. we should think of uh, like as the size of training set. Yes, yes. And another one is about this uh, relation. Can you extend this um, this functional di dimension to non-value networks or not? Because the Jacobian is def well-defined for for different uh, activation functions and uh, i'm not sure wh why it's specific for for radio networks right so um yeah you can absolutely define the notion of functional dimension for networks with other activation functions um for for say smooth ones or other piecewise linear activation functions um and but but i think what will happen um depending on the activation function is that you don't get this kind of spread in functional dimension. So it's not as interesting perhaps in those other settings. Um, and we focus on ReLU in particular because ReLU is so widely used for regression tasks. Or, or at least that's my understanding mm -hmm. is that ReLU is kind of the most commonly used. But yeah, you can certainly um, talk about functional dimension much more easily for other activation functions, especially smooth ones. But I think if, um, if the Pfefferman, Markle, sorry, the, that, that, that original work of Pfefferman, Markle, and Albertini and Sontag from the 90s um, is telling us that, that for, for a lot of those activation functions um, that are commonly used, uh, that are smooth, um, you don't have any interesting spread of the functional dimension. So you could certainly define it, but it might not be a very interesting thing to study. Okay. Okay. So, so, so the main takeaway here is that there is a spread for the functional dimension, or at least these experiments indicate that there probably is a pretty interesting spread. Again, you know, the, the, the caveats are that this is just approximate because we're not certain that we're nailing the functional dimension on the nose. Um, and then you also asked about batch. Um, so the point is that you need to pick a collection of points from your domain. And this is kind of like picking a batch for training. Um, and so when you pick a batch for training or like a mini batch for training, or maybe you're, you're, you're doing stochastic gradient descent with a, a batch size of one, um, then, um, then the, um, what this batch functional dimension is measuring is the subspace of, of the tangent space of parameter space near the parameter in which you're stepping. So for stochastic gradient descent, um, if you pick a batch of one, you wouldn't necessarily be able to achieve all of the local um, directions and parameter space. Um, you, would be, you, you would be restricted just to those parameters that actually change the value of the function at that point. Um, so that's the relationship between how the dynamics of um, training during gradient descent for a batch are related to this notion of functional dimension. Okay. Um, oh, I see that there's another um, question in chat, but does the result you show depend on how you choose the random values of the parameters? Um, right, so the, the, um, the experiments, um, so let me just show you, oops, sorry. Um, so this is how we sampled the weights and the bias. Um, and this, I guess, according to David, is the standard way of sampling weights and weights and biases. Um, but certainly, yeah, I would guess that the that the results would change depending on how you sample. Absolutely. But 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 I don't really know how much. These these experiments were actually quite expensive to run. Um, so it'd be interesting to run them with different um, different probability distributions that you're sampling from for the parameters. That's a great question. Okay, um, so um, I think we're supposed to, so we might not have that much time um, for this last part. So I'll just kind of go somewhat quickly. Um, and maybe, maybe, Maybe I'll actually just end by talking a little bit about why we should care about functional dimension. Just and, and this again is just going to be heuristics. Um, so as I mentioned, um, 
Um, so as we're training, we are training in parameter space, but um, but actually the empirical loss, whatever loss function we choose, um, the, the empirical loss is only going to depend on the function, not necessarily the parameter. So if you have redundancy, then um, uh, there are kind of large swaths of function space um, that um, that represent the same function. So that's what I mean by high redundancy. Um, so the heuristic is that low functional dimension will correspond to a low complexity function because you don't have very many um, levers to pull to change the value of your function. And this should also correspond to high local redundancy, meaning um, near the function, there are a lot of other functions, uh, you know, near the parameter, there are a lot of other functions nearby that give the same function. Sorry, a lot of parameters nearby that give the same function. And what I'm trying to um, motivate is that low functional dimension should correspond to high local redundancy. Um, which should mean that if you're looking at global minima of the loss landscape, so these are what you're trying to get to um, in gradient descent, that correspond to parameters with low functional dimension. So the heuristic is that it should be the case that um, locally then you're also flat in more directions, that the loss landscape is flat in more directions. And I'm putting a star here because this is not a theorem. This is just a heuristic. This is just, um, I mean, what's preventing it from being a theorem is that we um, we don't quite understand yet exactly how the functional dimension at a particular parameter impacts the functional dimension nearby in all cases. But um, I think this is a reasonable heuristic that low functional dimension should correspond to high local redundancy, lots of symmetries nearby, which means that um, the, the level sets, so here, here's a, a picture of what I mean here. Um, again, this is a terrible simplistic picture, but um, if, you're, if you're thinking of this as representing parameter space and there is just maybe one direction in which you can move that changes the function, then there will be lots of directions in which you can move that don't change the function. And of course, if you don't change the function, you don't change the loss. So level sets for the function should be contained in level sets for the loss, no matter what loss you choose. Um, and so th this, is, th this is what I mean by um, uh, um, uh, low functional dimension, which means low complexity should correspond to lots of flat regions, like, like locally very flat regions in your lost landscape. Um, so I'm seeing some questions in chat. So um, could stochastic gradient descent be altered to make it more effective? Um, um, so first of all, hi, Linda, it's great to see you. Um, stochastic gradient descent be altered to make it more effective, avoiding redundancy. Yeah, you know, th th there is some work along these lines. Um, so, there, there's some work that I can send you later. Um, uh, what's it called? Um, they have a really nice name name for it, but it's follow on work from the the quiver neural network quiver representation theory work of Armenta Jadoin, where they um, uh, kind of tunnel in um, parameter space to go from parameters that. Um, what, what do they call it? Um, different different parameters that represent the same function, um, and they they sort of leap around. Um, so th there are algorithms that use this redundancy, but I actually think that the redundancy is um, is biasing the optimization algorithm in a nice way, which is which is what I want to say next. Um, so <clears throat> there is recent work and. Um, I'm not going to be able to do any of this justice. Um, I, ha I definitely haven't absorbed this yet, but um, but the work that I'm most familiar with um, was from a talk that I saw at Chow Ma, um, which is this first, which was partially based on this first paper. Um, but the idea here is that actually 
there is some kind of um, behavior that's coming out of um, uh, the the flatness, the 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 the, um, the eigenvalues of the Hessian for the for the loss um, that is preferencing portions of the global um, uh, global minimum of the loss landscape that are that have um, more zero eigenvalues for the Hessian, so flatter regions of the loss landscape. So at least these three papers um, talk about this. Um, and um, I would love it. I'm sure that this is not a complete list. Um, and I would love it if, um, if anybody in this audience knows any more work of this kind, um, because I, I've, I've heard it um, a lot spoken of as, as a sort of belief that for some reason, um, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent preferences flatter regions of the lost landscape. Um, you're somehow pulled in those directions. Um, but, um, but, but I would love to read more about this. But the, the, the upshot should be that if that is the case, then it will also preference, it, preference functions of lower functional dimension by this heuristic. So in other words, this kind of behavior will implicitly regularize um, even in um, high parametric dimension. Okay, so um, I have more that I was going to say, but I, I think this is a good place for me to stop. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I think this is a great talk. Um, let me first stop, uh, stop the recording.